last year when we asked, you guys told us that the number one topic that you wanted addressed in chapel was the church. And I asked a couple of you what that meant. And what you said was, we want to know what the purpose of the church is. And why should I be involved in a local body when I can go to chapel and get what feels like the same thing, the same experience? And so what's the purpose of the church? The other thing you said was, we are really scared about the, what seems like petty divisions inside of the church. So there are these real questions that we're wrestling with about the church and the purpose of the church and our own involvement. And so that's what this conference is about. And that's why I'm excited that Nick Gibson, here from High Point Church in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, is our keynote speaker. I'm excited that it's Nick because Nick has done some of his own thinking about those very questions which were personal to him and which he has wrestled with and which he has discovered uh, answers, his own answers to, which I'm excited for him to share with us. And because in his leadership at High Point Church, I've seen those ideas play out because that is a church that was in decline when he came to High Point Church a few years ago and is now, as I experience High Point Church when I go back on breaks, is experiencing all sorts of new health as a body of believers. So his ideas are playing out in really exciting ways at his church. I'm excited for him to be here with us. If you'd please help me welcome Pastor Nick Gibson. Howdy, Brian. I promise that'll be my only Mark Driscoll quote this morning. It's good to be in the South, man, where people look each other in the eye and say hi sometimes and don't key your car if you have an NRA sticker and stuff like that, you know. Um, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin, which is where the Freedom From Religion Foundation was founded. Clarence Darrow was their great hero, and it's a great irony for me to get to be here. So I'm excited about that. Um, I was a person, when I was your age, the last thing that I wanted to do was be a pastor. Literally the last thing in the world Partly because I figured it was probably the unsexiest vocation ever, and I would never get a proper wife. But uh, more than that, I just thought it would be the most boring thing you could possibly do with your life. And what I wanted to be was a professor. And so uh, I I wish I was a scholar. I'm a practitioner. What can I tell you? So let's see if this works. Okay, so I'm going to be here for five talks, and you don't know me. And so this first talk, what I want to do is kind of go through my story and make a couple bombastic statements that you can argue about at lunch and hopefully in your classes. I mean, the whole point of guest speakers really isn't to do the teaching. That might scare Ben a little bit, but we talked about this. But it's basically to, like, blow everything up and for then you guys to discuss it for a month with your teachers, really. So um, so I'll do a little bit of that this morning, and then later in the talk I'll tell you what we're going to do the next four. Is that cool? Okay. So one of the main things I want to... The main challenge I want to make for you this morning is this, that every Christian in every generation has to decide whether you're going to build the church or abandon her. And you're going to make that decision pretty much in the next four years. If you, if you don't, if you choose to abandon her, then you're going to, you're going to do what we call the silent decade for a lot of you. And then you'd be like, oh crap, I have kids. I should probably go to a church or something. And then like a fraction of you will go back then. But, um, so for me, I grew up um, in a nominal Roman Catholic family. My mom's Catholic bishop, when she was confirmed, was Pope Pius XII, because she was in Rome. And um, my dad kind of went up and grew up in an American Baptist church, but um, went to Syracuse University and um, was involved in a fairly legalistic church and was part of you know 19, early 1960s evolutionary theory in the science departments of uh, Syracuse, and that was sufficient for him. And he had a really bad breakup and was kind of mad at God about that. And that pretty much made him an agnostic, agnostic for the rest of his life. So I grew up in what I call the positive agnostic and negative agnostic home. My mom didn't believe but sort of wanted to, and my dad didn't believe and really didn't want to. But my mom still took us to church because when my grandfather, Nicola, who I'm named after, was on his deathbed, he looked at my mom and he said, he said, here's what I want. I want you to take my grandsons to church. Which for my mom meant enrolling us in um, Catholic after school activities because the Catholic church was right next to my school. And so the advice she gave me as I went off as a fourth grader, third grader to parochial education after school was don't let them brainwash you. (laughs) Which sounds kind of cynical, but she grew up under Mussolini. Right? 
So that was kind of interesting. And so I went to Mass, and because I was this ADD kid who also had narcolepsy, which is an interesting mix, um, the, the only way I could survive a 45-minute Catholic Mass was by becoming an altar boy, because at least you got to do stuff, right? You got to take the stuff to the priest and back and ring the bell and do whatever. And there was this girl named Jessica Wilde who was really cute who I'd make faces at in the thing, and my mom would be really angry, but the priest didn't know because I was behind him, right? <laughs> and so... Um, but, but then it came time for confirmation. I was like in seventh grade or whatever that was. And I remember going through the confirmation class and learning the Apostles' Creed and um, some things like that. Basically, it was Apostles' Creed and don't have sex. And I was talking to the priest one time before the service. And I was asking him about the Bible and about the Apostles' Creed. And he was just like, yeah, I don't really believe that. And I remember being in the sacristy before we went out to do church. And he was going to do the whole Mass. And I had been going to this camp, and I was like starting to like believe in the Bible and in Jesus and stuff. I was a pretty Christ-haunted person without being converted, I think. And I was like, what, what do you mean you don't? Like, how come you get to wear the purple thing then? <laughs> like, that doesn't work, right? And so I, it was very disillusioning for me. And for me, the Catholic Mass didn't make any sense at that point in my life. A four-minute homily and 45 minutes of repetition didn't work for me. Because I didn't understand what, a, what I was as a human being. So I didn't understand that my biggest problem was remembering the truth. I thought my biggest problem was knowing the truth. So it seemed like there should be a longer talk, right? And so it seemed incredibly unsubstantive. And so I, I sort of emerged from that experience as the guy who leads it doesn't believe. Man, am I bored. And this is so unsubstantive, I can hardly stand it. At the same time, I was at this, I was getting like fifth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. And okay, so I was the kid that didn't get hair on his legs till the second half of 10th grade. Okay. (laughs) So you can imagine what it was like trying to get girls interested in me when I was in fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Okay. Fair enough. And so I heard that there was this Christian camp that you could go to for a week, canoe, do ropes courses, all kinds of stuff like that. And there were two girls for every guy at this camp. It sounded like Camelot. And I was like, I would like to be one of King Arthur's men. (laughs) So I went and talked to my parents. And my parents were like, oh, keep them out of trouble. Get them out of our house. So they sent me to this camp. And so I went. And I accepted Jesus every year for like five or six years there. And that was the first place I experienced what you might just call Christian community or fellowship, right? Where there were Christians who were really Christians who actually treated each other like they were, the other person was made in God's image too. And it wasn't all just jockeying for position in the cliques and running with the pack and all of that sort of thing, which I was very used to because I went to public high school. And so that was a very odd thing for me, that people who are way, clearly way cooler than me were treating me like an actual human being without me first pledging my allegiance in every way possible and following them around. Like you had to do at school if you wanted to be in the cool group if you weren't tall and hairy. (laughs) So after that, I went to uh, the college, a college uh, called SUNY Oswego in in the state system in New York. And it's designed for students that mainly major in girls and sports in high school. And I mean, just not a very good college. But I went there because I wasn't a, a very good student. And so I got there and... My experience with the church during those years was kind of intermittent. I started going to this, basically this Bible church that had 30 people in it. And we had to order 90-minute tapes. I'm sorry, a cassette tape was this thing that was used in an archaeological era (laughs) in which there were magnetic strips. Never mind. The church had to order 90-minute tapes because you couldn't tape the pastor's sermon on a 60-minute tape. Okay? Which kind of messed with my unsubstantive stereotype a little bit. And, and as I was at Beaver Camp, because, I, because the best way to meet girls at Beaver Camp was to become a counselor in training than a counselor, right? So I, I was in that process. And so I would meet 12 or 15 different pastors a summer, and some of them I didn't really care for. But there were always two or three that were kind of intriguing. But my college church was a real mix for me, because it was a friendly church where Christ is exalted, is what the sign said. Um, and it was, it was, in a lot of ways, it was a good church. It was sort of an independent Pentecostal church. And it had started as a college ministry. What had happened was, there was this anthropology professor that hated God, who in the 60s did his PhD research on the Jesus movement, right? And he ended up getting saved, and probably dropping a bunch of acid. But he became a Christian, like, radically saved. And so he came back, and so his classes always had, like, 450 students in it, because he was a super charismatic guy. So he, like, starts talking about, he starts talking about his research, in class, and he's talking about Jesus and stuff like that. And like hundreds of kids get saved, and he starts this church, right? 
It's really cool. And then he moves to another city and starts a church there, and blah, blah, blah. And then 25 years pass. And here's the church of all these college students that got saved who are now in their 40s and 50s. And they don't have the same heart for the university anymore. They want the university students to come, but they don't want to have any service that's at any other time but 9 a.m. And I'm like, look, my drunk friends are not going to come at 9 o'clock. And their response to me was, you're not a pastor. Right? And I'm like, I'm leading the college ministry by myself with no staff. There were three people when I got here. There's 45 people now. Most of them come to this church. Will you throw me a bone and move the service time 25 minutes? No. Right? And every day I'm standing in 907 Seneca Hall looking across this thing. And on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights, thousands of students are going out to our nearly world record number of bars, just completely oblivious to reality. That Christ is king, that they're made for a purpose. It's not for taking their pants off. It's, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, if they're just not keyed in, their studies don't point to Jesus, nothing points to Jesus. And it was heart wrenching for me, and to see the church just disconnected from that was very difficult for me. I did manage to graduate, though, and it was not a very helpful degree. So the one main thing I got from school, I always say, is Alexi, my wife. Like, I just, she makes it worth it. That's all I can say. I got married, and I would not have apparently met her if I had not gone to Oswego. So that makes it worth it. That's the, I, lo- I love that picture. Okay, so <laughs> there came this point. I was 19. Okay, so you're going to you're gonna have to give me a little grace of the arrogance here, okay? Because I was like 19 years old probably or 20 years old. I'm sitting at this, in this church. There's a pastor preaching up front. He's preaching a 45-minute sermon. He's apparently prepared about three minutes worth He's saying the same thing in the same words that he said it for over the last two months. Just, it's not, it's not even different from even a different passage or even said a different way, right? It's, and, I, and I remember sitting there, I was so angry. And I remember, I remember this thought clear as day, and where I was sitting in the congregation when I thought, I could get up right now and do better than this. I get out of my seat, I could walk up there, they gave me a microphone, I could preach right, no prep. And I could preach better than this. And I'm 19. This is wrong. Church shouldn't be this bad. Right? So the college years were progressing. And so I decided the last thing I want to do is be part of the local church. Now, I recognized probably I couldn't entirely leave the local church. But I realized that I was going to have to have this like cold, semi-divorced relationship with the, with the local church. That I was going to probably have to go to one. I was probably going to have to not say bad things about it. But I was going to invest my life in Christ in a different venue, right? And so because I was in the university that was totally pointed in another direction, I really connected with people who philosophically were seeking to engage the university. So back in the 90s, before there was such a thing hardly as Christian publishing, like like right now, you have to figure out what books not to read, right? Like if you decide, I'm going to read a book about Jesus or something, like there's 50,000 of them, and you have to decide which one of the 50,000 you're going to read. Okay, when I was in college, there were nine Christian books, okay, in the world. And I, you know, and I had to, like, I had to pick one of the six, you know. And so one of the the book that I got, because it was sitting on a shelf, because my brother had got it at his university ministry, was a book by Ravi Zacharias. I don't know if you know him. He was, he's like a philosopher, apologist guy. He does evangelistic talks in universities and all over the world. He's really, he does a good job. Anyway. So I was like, I want to be Ravi Zacharias. So I read a bunch of his books. I read a bunch. Of, I, so I, I really got into what's called apologetics or the, the philosophical pursuit of defending the faith, giving a res, reason for the hope within us, right? And so I became like ph- philosophical argument guy, right? And um, so I was moving along and I was like, okay, I'm going to need more training if I'm going to do this. So what am I going to do? About the same time, I read a book called Exegetical Fallacies by D.A. Carson. I don't know if you, you probably, if you, you probably should have to read that in some of your classes, but there's probably a better book now that you read. But um, basically the whole book is, here's how people make errors when interpreting the Bible, right? And it's, I mean, just, it's just page after page of like, some people do this and it's totally wrong. And some people do this and it's totally wrong. Just the word study fallacies was like, it was like 25 different word study fallacies. And I realized I had not only made every one of these, but I had taught every one of these, right? I'm like a junior in college at this point, And I'm like, I might be screwing up at this, <laughs> right? So... Don Carson, the guy who wrote this book, taught at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Ravi Zacharias, the only, the only theological degree he has is an MDiv from Trinity Evangelical. His undergrad is in, in uh, hotel management, and all of his doctorates are honorary. So I was like, 
dude, this guy can do that with an MDiv. That's pretty cool. That's, maybe I'll do that. So I went to Trinity. I showed up at the same time as this guy, Greg Scharf. He'd been a pastor for 20 years in Fargo, had just come into the practical theology department, and realized that he, I needed him. Because uh, Greg Scharf is from Texas, but he's basically British. Because after he did his theological training, he, he, mentor, he was mentored under John Stott in London, right? So, and he married a Brit, Ruth. And like when you go to dinner at his house, married couples don't sit together. You can only sit together if you're dating. It's like classic British etiquette, right? You put your things at five o'clock and it's very wonderful. Anyway, so, and I was just like bombastic 19, like I was 21 or 22 at the time. And I'm just like, well, I had preaching lab with him and I would go from talking like this to shouting really loud in less than a second. And he would refer to that in critiques as unhelpful voice modulations. <laughs> it was just that kind of relationship. But I became his graduate assistant. He became a mentor to me. And he came and preached. He preached at my at high point when I got there. And he referred to me as my most improved preaching student. <laughs> but here's what happened. Part, part of my seminary studies was to actually study theology. And what happened when I studied theology was I realized that my doctrine of the local church was totally wrong. That whatever my experiences were, my doctrine of the local church was totally wrong. And because I had fallen into what probably is true of many of you, is that I had a what I thought was a biblical doctrine of the church, but I only thought philosophically in terms of the church universal. That there was this spiritual amalgamation of Christians throughout time, space, history, nations, languages, and so on. They're all going to get rounded up in the end when whatever Revelation is talking about happens. And then we'll all be together. And at that point, we might like each other. But the connection between that and a building in town with people in it that has a nursery did not really connect with each other. And one of the things I learned from Greg, and I checked this with him this week actually, was that this is what he taught me, that God does not only have a mind for the formless organism, what we like to call the universal church, but that the church is both an organism and a supporting organization. And Jesus instituted them both. In complementary relationship with another. If you look at the way Jesus talks about the church, and if you look at the way the apostles talk about the church, you cannot make sense of most of the contexts if you put in universal church, conceptually. If you just, just go to all the places that talk about the church in the Bible, and especially the New Testament, of course, and then put in the concept universal church, where church is, or there's talk about the church, and it, the sentence doesn't make any sense. Because in Paul's mind and in Jesus' mind, the church organism and the church organization as instituted are inseparable. It's philosophical universal reality and it's concrete local reality are the same thing. I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. I'm going to have to skip because I don't... I, I know my sermons at my church are like 54 minutes, so I... 30 minutes is hard for me, okay? What I realized in my seminary years was I had accepted the idea that the universal church could not be abandoned. I knew that. I knew on some level I couldn't abandon the conceptual universal church. But what I had not accepted was that was the prominence and the centrality of the concrete local congregation in God's plan of redemption. That God had given it a place that I was fundamentally ignoring. And that if I was going to obey Jesus in any meaningful sense and care about what he cared about in any meaningful sense, my attitude, relationship with, and movement toward the local church had to totally change. I didn't realize why, but I did realize that. I'm going to skip that for now. And one of the reasons this is important is because I didn't really understand the dynamics of why I didn't want to accept that. One of the reasons I didn't want to accept that was I hadn't accepted what it means to be an adult yet. And I thought I had, because I was li- I had signed my own lease. So I assumed that that meant that I was a grown-up, right? And I was in seminary now, so I was actually paying my own bills, right? So I had signed my own lease, I was paying my own, I was married. Surely I'm a grown-up. In the young adults ministry at my church, we have this, this ministry for people who are post-undergrad, because we have Campus Crusade and InterVarsity and stuff in Madison, so we don't replicate what they do better. We have this ministry for people coming out of the college ministries who are now lost, basically. They're like, what do I do now? I don't have any friends. And, and so they come, in, they come to my church, and they're like, now what? And I'm like, okay, so now you have to be a grown-up. Here's what a grown-up is. Here's when you know you're a grown-up. When you come to High Point Church, 
You have a conversation with five people over the course of your morning. One is five years old. One is 51 years old. One is 82 years old. And two are your age. When it, when it's, when you easily flow intergenerationally throughout all people and you're no longer stuck within plus or minus three years of yourself, that's when you've become a grown up. You no longer have a nursery for your age. Until you get there, you're just really looking for a glorified youth group and you're not a grown up, not emotionally. And you see, I didn't realize that. That's where I was. I was stuck there. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people who don't like the church, but know they have to be part of it, become youth pastors. (laughs) That's a little bombastic. I know. There's something to it, though. And here's the reason why this is important. G.K. Chesterton wrote, like, oh, this is kind of a digression. Okay, G.K. Chesterton wrote this book, or wrote, wrote an essay one time about um, why wives can be unhappy, right? And he says, here's why wives can easily be unhappy. And this is all the more true now. Because they do 50 things and none of them well, right? So, so for example, let's, let's, say, let's take a, a domestic wife from 1921 when G.K. Chesterton was writing this. So a wife would cook dinner, but not as good as a chef. Right? She'd drive her family around, but not as good as a chauffeur. She'd make love to her husband, but not as well as a pair more. She would, and you go through all 50 things that she, she doesn't have time to do them all like an artisan, right? She's just gotta crank out life. And she does it over and over and over and over and over and over. And that's what life is, right? Life is, you wake up again, you get out of bed again, you take a shower again, hopefully, uh, and, <laughs> College years, right? And, you know, you get dressed again, and you get, you take, get your keys again, you put on your coat again, you get it again, 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 again. You see, life is all about repetition. And if you're not emotionally, if your character isn't formed in such a way as which, so you can do the same thing 50,000 times and be happy every single time you do it, you can't be happy in real life. Not only, so the, the local church is in some ways the least of your problem. You'll never be able to be happy married. You'll never be able to be happy as a parent. You get this wrong, and you'll get divorced in less than 10 years after you get married, probably. You'll just feel empty inside. You won't know why. You just don't feel like you're just not in love anymore. No, it's not that you're not. It's not because you didn't go on enough dates. It's because you're a shallow human being and you don't have the character to rejoice in monotony. Because God, Chesterton says this essay, can make the sun rise every morning and say, do it again. And, he, and the reason why every day he looks the same is because God hasn't gotten tired of making them that way yet. God, and my wife actually wrote this on the window of the playroom so she wouldn't shoot herself. <laughs> so we have four children. God is strong enough to rejoice in monotony. And one of the reasons why we don't love the local church actually isn't all of our objections, and I'll get to those in a second, but it's partly because we have no idea what it means to live real life yet. We are still addicted to novelty. And because our technological culture can give us a hope that we could live our whole lives that way, we still hope that we could live our whole lives that way. But it's just going to destroy you. So all of these experiences that I was having and pushing me towards the local church did not resolve any of my objections against the local church. Right? I don't know if you recognize this list, but this is how these were my objections to wanting to be part of the local church. Right? Irrelevant, boring, monotonous, hypocritical, disobedient, unbelieving, moralistic, ritualistic, and legalistic, Stuck in and divided by tradition, lack of substance, unconcerned with my generation, lack of serious excellence, lack of important emphasis, presence of some overemphasis, ineffectiveness, lack of real godliness. Did I miss any? Yeah, of course I did. You could just come up and tell me later. But that's not a complete list. It's just all that will fit on the slide. Okay. <clears throat> Here's why I asked you this, that question at the beginning. All of those objections... Don't make any decision for you. They're not a decision. Right? They just simply lead you to a question. Okay, all those things are true. So what? So what are you going to do about it? Right? I remember sitting there when I was 19 thinking, I can do better than this right now. And I remember thinking, is the church 
something that I need to change as best I can or be used by God in some way? Or is it just, just another organization or group of people that have let me down? As I, as I was studying theology in seminary, one of the things that I realized was that all of my heroes had given their life to Christ by concretely giving their lives to the church. And not the universal theoretical church, but the real, concrete, actual church with real people in it, which is the universal church in its local manifestation. Um, I read uh, G.K. Chesterton's um, biography of St. Francis of Assisi, who actually didn't ever say, there's no historical evidence he ever said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Okay, I don't know if you ever read anything about St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis of Assisi was known for walking out into nature and preaching to trees and birds. He wasn't exactly the, don't use words if you don't have to sort of person. Okay? and But here's here's something that is part of a historical tradition about St. Francis of Assisi. After he was done being a playboy and going to war and going on crusades and nearly getting killed and getting ransomed by his rich daddy and all that stuff, he went to this totally broken down Catholic church. Well, Catholic in the sense that it was then. And there he was praying inside of it and there was this painted crucifix um, and he felt as though God spoke to him, Francis, go and rebuild my dilapidated church. Which at first he took to rebuild that church with his bare hands and he started doing it. And later he, he realized that Jesus had called him to rebuild his church. That is, the vibrancy of the actual community of Christians he was around. John Huss, very similar. Well, he was a theological reformer, right He wanted to reform the theology of the church so that the people in the church could be free to believe the gospel. And he was burned alive for it, but he said this, every earthly pilgrimage ought faithfully to love Jesus Christ, the Lord, the bridegroom of that church, and also the church herself, his bride. Luther, the same thing. His passion, people, people now say, here's the failure of the Protestant Reformation, that it freed the human from the church. It, the, because when it took away the absolute authority of the church, people could do whatever they wanted. But that's, okay, we can argue about whether or not that's true. But that wasn't Luther's passion. Luther's passion wasn't to free people from the church. Luther's passion was to free the people of the church to believe the gospel. He wanted to free the church from corruption, not us from the church. I don't know if you've read the Lord of the Rings novels, but one of the great themes of Tolkien's work is that there's three places every person can essentially be in when there's a great war in the cosmos in which they live. They can, A, they can live in obliviousness, which is the Shire. It's this beautiful place where everything grows. It's beautiful. It's green. People laugh and sing. That's why there's all the beer and smoking. I don't know if you you realize this. The reason there's all the beer and smoking in Tolkien's book is because that represented peace. Right? Being able to go to the pub, sit with friends, drink and sing and smoke. It wasn't like, oh, look, we can smoke. That wasn't the point. They're European Christians. Okay? That, with that, (laughs) with that point, it's okay to smoke and love Jesus in Europe. Okay? It's, the reason why is it was supposed to re- represent that things grow in the Shire. People are at peace. There's lo- and their obliviousness to the war that is consuming their world. The other is exile, which is the picture of Rivendell. It's beautiful. It's fully aware of what's happening. It's at peace. It knows war is coming. It doesn't want to get involved. And if it can leave, it will. And that's the figure of Aragorn is that figure. The Dunedain are the the ones that they realize it, but ultimately they engage. And the the way Tolkien tells that story is to show Frodo and to show Aragorn, one exiled and one oblivious, recognizing that something bigger is happening and they can't be oblivious anymore and they can't live in exile. They have to fight the war. It's the only authentic option. It's the only option in which they don't lose themselves. It's the only option that has any hope. Which I don't know if you know, you probably don't know Aragorn or Aragorn's elven name. Why would I think you would? But his elven name is Esthel, which is elven for hope. Right? Little Lord of the Rings nerdiness there. (laughs) So in the next four talks, oh man, 
The next four talks, here's what I want to do. Uh, tonight we'll do a biblical theology of the church because conviction is your greatest ally in cowardice. And the reason we aren't part of the local church is because of our cowardice. That's the real reason. And so we need conviction to get us over that, to get past those 15 to 27 to 114 objections, and to say, okay, well, well let's do something. Right? The second is that you have to have a biblical understanding of the purpose of the church because if you've got that wrong, and a lot of people have it wrong these days, That's going to be a problem. I'll talk a little bit about social justice theology and stuff like that, but that'll be a 30-minute talk, so we'll see. And then third is going to be a sociological or or philosophical idea of why you desperately need the church, even though you may not think you do. The reason you don't think you need the church is because you don't understand what a human being is. If you understood what a human being is, you'd realize you do need the church, and I'll talk about that. And then the last is I'll talk about, well, so so how how do we be part of one? What does it look like to be in your early 20s and be vigorously part of the local church? Okay, let's end with this in 30 seconds. So these will just be assertions. Here's what you need to realize. You may think you're a good Bible student, that you're studying Christian theology, that you're going to a Christian college, that you're the pure ones or whatever. You may think that, but let me just tell you something straight away. If you have a weak doctrine and practice in the local church, you have weak doctrine. You may think you have, you have, you have the right priorities. If your butt isn't in a local church on Sunday morning, you have terrible theology. Because, and here's why. Because all of Christian theology, when made practical, concretely in real life, points to what the local church is. That's why Jesus instituted it. And if you cannot end up there, then all these arrows are pointing in the wrong direction. You don't have good theology. You may have articulate theology. You may have interesting theology. You may have philosophical theology. You may have exegetically semi-correct theology in portions of scripture, but you do not have strong theology if your doctrine of the local church isn't strong. And secondly, you need to come to the realization that you cannot live in a dichotomy between the universal church and the local church. There is no dichotomy because the church is not an abstract object. Can I have one minute? One minute on this? Okay. Okay. I don't know how much philosophy you've taken. The number one is an abstract object. There is no one, right? There's only one of things. So there's one person there. But he's not a one. There is no one. One is a theoretical object. It's a, philosophically, an abstract object. It has no concrete reality. The church is not an abstract object. There is no such thing as the church abstract. There is no abstract object of the church that you can like. It's like me liking the idea of my wife and never speaking to her. Okay, there's, there is, the only thing there is, is the actual concrete church. When in the end Jesus amalgamates it all, you will be able to refer to that as the, as the universal church in a, in a, in a single local manifestation. But there, you, there is no such thing as the universal church apart from its concrete manifestation. It's a philosophical falsity that we believe for other psychological reasons because we want to. But if you don't believe in the local church with your feet and butt, you don't believe in the universal church, you should quit kidding yourself. Now on that positive note, let's pray. (laughs) Father, thanks so much for letting me be here with these folks. And I hope that what I say will just stimulate a lot of conversation. And I hope that it would be lively and argumentative, not against people, but with ideas. I pray that you would stir up your people to deal with this so that we we can be convictional people of character. And I pray that over the next three days, that some some folks here would begin to see the beauty of your monotonous, normal, repetitive, local church. I pray that they would begin to see the real beauty of your actual bride, not the theoretical cartoon, superhero drawing style that they have of it in their minds, but of the real life church that you are building that is terrible in the eyes of devils throughout all space and time. That it is us, the real people, and you are its real head the risen Savior. I pray that this would be a great three days for us and 